Good morning. Welcome to Unlock the Bible Now. I'm Brother Scott Mitchell, very happy. You can join us again this Sunday for another message from God's Word. And we're gonna talk about gratitude here in just a moment. But I wanna thank everybody, of course, for uh, sharing these videos, for uh, hopefully you're downloading the app, the UTB Now or Unlock the Bible Now uh, app. You can get from any uh, app store. And uh, realize, of course, that app has more than just these Bible messages. There's actually a Bible, that, and you can choose the version you like of there. Uh, we, we even post a little bit of music. There's links to our websites. There's even links to the podcast. And um, we just want you to take advantage of that tool and use it uh, however you can in the hopes that maybe we can reach more people. But thank you for your prayers, for your support for us, your donations, of course, that allows this ministry to continue. And should the Lord provide, we'll continue and preach his word as uh, long as we can till he takes us home and out of this world. Why don't you join me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we're grateful to you for mercy and grace, and we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who died for our sins at Calvary and was raised again for our justification. We thank you for the word you've preserved perfectly for us, and we thank you for thy Holy Spirit that guides us into all understanding. And we just ask right now that you would open our understanding to see the truth you would have us learn today, that it would be a blessing to each one within the sound of my voice and that it would bring praise and glory and honor to thy name. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You know, it's easy to get caught up in the things of this world and take for granted all that the Lord has given us. And we see chaos and confusion all around us, and we, we know the Lord warned us through the Apostle Paul that perilous times are coming, and I think we, we're there. But in spite of all this, we have so much to be thankful thankful for. So today we're going to talk about gratitude. And we're going to start in the book of Colossians. As always, I'm using a King James Bible, but this is a Tyndall print version, so I use that for page number references. You'll find this on page 1718. Page 1718. I've had some people tell me <laughs> I go a little too fast, so uh, let me uh, give you time to catch up. Uh, but you can always... Um, pause, even though this is a live broadcast in some cases, you can pause the uh, the recording. But we're going to read from chapter 3, verse 15. And Paul writes, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. I just wanted to start with a simple passage there, because I want you to notice the word let in the verse. We are in control of whether or not the peace of God rules in our hearts. We allow it. Let means allow. So when he says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, it's tied to what we allow to happen. And I think the key is gratitude. Go with me to Philippians chapter 4. Just one book over to the right, if you will, or to the left, rather, excuse me. And um, you'll find this on page 17, 13. Philippians chapter 4, and we start reading in verse 6. Again, Paul writes, be careful for nothing. And the word careful there is not like using caution when you cross the street. It's like we would say anxious today. Anxiety, overly concerned, overly full of care is really what it means. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If we're going to let the peace of God rule in our hearts, it will keep our hearts and our minds. So we can see from this passage that peace and gratitude go hand in hand. I believe the key to letting the peace of God rule in our hearts is thanksgiving or gratitude. The word gratitude doesn't show up in the King James Bible, but it's thanksgiving. It's being thankful for that which we have, for that which the Lord provided. And there's so many countless examples of gratitude shown in the scriptures. You can't read the Psalms without reading the word thanks, thanksgiving, praise over and over and over again. 
but we're just going to examine two short examples of being grateful in spite of the circumstances. Because when we talked about careful, and it's really worry, and some people say, oh, I, I worry about this, or I'm a worrier. And why? Why are you worrying? What are you worried about? Uh, it's almost like saying, and I'm guilty of this, so I guess I'm pointing the finger at me, at me uh, but it's like I don't believe the Lord can handle the situation. That's really where worry comes from, anxiety and fear and doubt. All of those things are, are not of God's spirit, so they must come from us, and they must come from a lack of faith. I'm not here to chide anybody for their faith. I, I've got enough problems with my own lack of faith, um, but we have examples of individuals that went through pretty dire circumstances compared to what we might go through day to day, and this is by no means to make light of what challenges we face every day. But look with me in Acts chapter 5. Let's just go to the scriptures and let's look at the examples God gave us. Acts chapter 5, we're going to start reading in verse 40. The page number is 1584. So Acts 5 verse 40, and what had just happened was the apostles were arrested and, and uh, stood sort of a trial for preaching in the temple. Uh, and a decision was made about what to do with them by this high council. So it's a political move. Verse 40, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, the command, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, the name of Christ. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So they didn't listen to the council or the political civil authorities at that time. They listened to the Lord. But what causes a person to rejoice in suffering? You know, they were they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, to be beaten unjustly. Why would them why would they rejoice in such a suffering? Well, they knew how much they had to be grateful for. And so did Paul. Paul and Silas encountered a similar thing. Move on over to chapter 16 of the same book, Acts. Acts chapter 16. And Paul and Silas actually get arrested and thrown in prison. And they were beaten as well. Look with me, page 1606. And what had happened was Paul had cast a devil out of a young woman that had some masters that used her for fortune telling, for soothsaying. And after he cast it out, verse 19, when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, their profit, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans." It's not really true, but that was the false accusation that always people bring. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Another beating. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, and you can't um, underscore how horrible that is, they took a cat of nine tails, which the Romans did, and whipped them, and ripped open the flesh of their backs. When they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Now that pretty much would be the end of my career. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know that I could suffer such a thing. Uh, verse 24, who having received such a charge, the jailer, thrust them into the inner prison, the worst of it, and made their feet fast in the stocks, literally put binders around their ankles. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And what's astounding is somebody got saved as a result of this. So God is able to make all things work together for good to them that love him. But can you imagine going through something like this? and then serving the Lord, praising God, 
and praying and singing? <clears throat> what causes two men who were beaten and imprisoned unjustly to pray and sing praises to God after such a treatment? I, I think it's just a simple answer. It's gratitude. And we just sometimes don't even understand how much we have to be grateful for. So before I even get into the scriptures that speak of all that God has done for us, let's take a moment to do an exercise in gratitude together. This is going to be something different than I normally do, but um, we're going to actually meditate on the things that we have to be thankful for. I know some of you may listen while you're driving, and obviously this wouldn't apply to you if you're driving or doing chores or something, but if you're in a position to do so, let's take a moment to reflect and find a place where you can sit quietly and comfortably and just take a deep breath and just stop thinking about whatever's on your mind, whatever's preoccupying you, you know, almost just like you would go through like a little meditation process. Some of you that meditate are very familiar with this. And and if you're not used to taking moments of calm and meditation, I might suggest you think about doing that. And And if you do, you can go through something like this. I'm no meditation expert. This is just me talking to you as a Bible teacher and I want you to just quietly stop and go back to the beginning of your life and think about your childhood. We may not have had the best parents or childhood in the world, but in most cases, after our parents gave us life, they clothed us, they fed us, they housed us, they raised us as best they could, and they saw that we were educated. So we can stop and thank them in our hearts for that. You know, we don't have to turn to the passage here. You can if you want to. But uh, while you're just sitting there thinking about being grateful and thankful to your parents, Ephesians 6, verse 2 and 3 says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. So just some of us, our parents may no longer be with us, but let's just thank our parents and our hearts for giving us a life, giving us a start and getting us to the point where we could stand on our own and become adults. We might have had struggles, and we might have faced some bad challenges, but here you are now, and so we can be thankful for that. Next, I want to think about your nearest kin. If you have brothers or sisters or close cousins, some of us had contentious upbringing with our siblings, and we might be holding on to that pain or the guilt. Um, I'm grateful that now, as an adult, my brother and sister, which were we were not close when we were young, we fought a lot and we squabbled, but we're closer than we ever have been. We're never like this as children. And one of the things that helped us is it was very healing for us to apologize to each other for our unkindness when we were young. I'm grateful for them now because soon they'll be all that remains of my immediate family. And um, it just sort of reminded me of Matthew chapter 5. Again, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Uh, I'm just reading these out while you're thinking. Maybe your eyes are closed and you're just meditating on gratitude, and that's good. Uh, but you're, you're familiar with the passage in Matthew 5, verse 23, where Christ said, Therefore, if thou, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remember that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. And it could be a brother, a sister, a, a close friend, it doesn't matter. Um, or maybe somebody who's not close anymore because of that. But let's let go of those things that we hold on to that separate us because they are the people that shaped us into who we are and we can be thankful. And I'd, I'd like to think that we can have gratitude in knowing that we have a good and healthy relationship with our family. Now, I want you to think of the friends you've had in your life that either helped you through an experience or a trial they helped you to grow up, and uh, maybe they defended you from a bully, or they took your side, uh, whatever. 
we may have lost touch with many people over the years, but I learned something or gained something valuable from each person who ever touched my life. So I'm grateful for that. In Proverbs 27, verse 17, we read that iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So I'm grateful for my friends. I'm saddened that I didn't stay in touch with a lot of friends that have impacted me over the years, but, um, you know, that's how life goes. But just right now in our hearts, we can thank God for every everyone who's touched our lives in some way that that brought something to us. And, and there's no reason to continue this exercise in gratitude or thankfulness um, ad infinitum. But uh, if you're if you're having trouble, think about uh, you can be grateful for your home, that you have a house to live in. You can be thankful for your job. Uh, maybe you have a good job and, and it, you know, uh, provides your needs, uh, your material needs. And you can be thankful for the material needs that you have. You have enough food, enough clothing, enough shelter. Uh, and sometimes you have to dig deep. Well, I don't like my job. Well, we're where you work, are you cool in the summer and warm in the winter? I mean, look for something <laughs> that you can find uh, to be grateful. And if nothing else, uh, ask yourself, are you in jail? <laughs> you know, if you're not in jail, you can be thankful for that. Uh, that's something that Brother Brian Sipes used to always say. Well, you're not in jail. So, so we could go on and on. But if you put your mind to it, you can find many things over which we can be grateful. But now I want to look at the eternal things. And if you want to continue meditating, you can, but if you'd rather just get back into the study of the word, that's perfectly fine. I'll start calling back out the page numbers again. Because in this exercise in gratitude, I want to look at what God has done for us and what we have to look forward to. So we start with just being thankful for family, friends, the things that we have in our life, and then let's move into what we have to look forward to. Let's start in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. Ephesians, chapter 1. I am probably the least qualified person in the world to talk about gratitude. I'm, I'm a complainer. Um, and uh, so maybe I need this message. And maybe that's why the Lord put it on my heart to preach to me. I think uh, he can preach to us through ourselves sometimes. Um Ephesians chapter 1, you'll find on page 1701, and we're going to start reading in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, notice it's past tense, so they're yours, hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I mean, that's a mouthful right there. But it tells me that I'm not sure we can even count all the spiritual blessings that we already have been blessed with. But we're going to try. We're going to look at a few. But just take a moment to consider that. You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Nothing that God intended for us has been withheld from us, whether they've been realized yet or not. Some things we'll see we have yet to obtain, but they're ours. And for that, we can be thankful. Look in verse 7 of the same chapter, same page, Ephesians 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Forgiveness of sins. Without this, there's no hope. This is where we start. We're going to spend eternity thanking God for his dear son shed blood, because that's how we came by. Forgiveness of sins, through redemption through his blood. Had Christ not died for our sins at Calvary, there would be no hope for us. So we start with thanking God for a son who died for us. Because you have been forgiven, according to the Bible, all trespasses. Sometimes people write me and ask, are there certain sins that God won't forgive? And the answer is no. You've been forgiven all trespasses. That right there is worth shouting over. I, I don't, you know, that's all I need to think about if I start to feel down and ungrateful. Then I just stop and remind myself, I've been forgiven all my sins. Let's get down to verse 8. We're just going to stay in chapter 1 here. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, 
having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Are you thankful that God gave us his wisdom to understand the mystery of his will? All the mysteries of God. And as we dig into more of what these spiritual blessings are, we're going to see a little bit about the mystery of his will, that we should be with him eternally in heaven. But right now, think about the fact that there are many people that pick up this book and read it and they do not have a clue. You can't just pick up a Bible and get saved and understand it. You've got to be you've got to be convicted by the Spirit of God to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior through the foolishness of preaching, the Bible says, to come to a relationship with the Lord. And then and only then can the Spirit of God teach you the deep things. So God made known to us the mystery of his will by giving us his wisdom. And I'm grateful for that. Look in verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And I want to focus on that phrase, obtained an inheritance. Do you know what that makes us? Heirs. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. No matter who you are in this world, you are a child. Let this sink in. You are a child of the highest royal family in the universe. That's astounding to me. I'm not worthy to be in the bottom of hell, but God has adopted us and seen to it that we would obtain an inheritance and an inheritance that you can't lose. Look in verse 13. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, that's like a guarantee, the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So think of it like this. If we go backwards, God will not be denied the praise of his glory. And the seal of the Spirit guarantees that we will be in his inheritance to give praise to his glory. It will take place when he redeems us out of this world, the, the physical redemption, the rapture. And we're sealed unto that. You can't even lose the inheritance or blow it like the prodigal son did because you're sealed with God's Holy Spirit. That That's worth shouting over too. That's worth jumping up and down. Uh, we can't lose or break the seal of God that guarantees that we have a part in his family and is an inheritance. And then we'll go to Ephesians chapter two. It's the next page, 1702. And we'll start in verse 1. And you hath he quickened. And the word quickened means made alive. And it's sort of like resurrection, but it's spiritual in this case. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And we could get into the whole judicial explanation of what that means, but suffice it to say, we were lost. And by quickening us through the death of Jesus Christ, we are passed from death into life. And not just any life, life eternal. We will live eternally with God. That's hard for me to wrap my head around. That he had forgiven me all trespasses because I was dead in trespasses. He quickened me, made me alive. We're going to receive a new body so that we can live eternally. But God wanted us to be with him. And instead of just allowing us to go our way, because we chose the path of sin, we were born into sin. We became an adult to choose to sin. And then at some point, he reached out. He found us. Salvation found us. We heard the truth of the gospel. We believed. That's, that's love that's unimaginable to me. And it's something for which we can be eternally grateful. And 
this inheritance that we're talking about when we live with him eternally, it's not limited to some exclusive room in the third heaven. Look in verse 6 there. Actually, starting in verse 5, and when, even when we were dead in sins, that condition we spoke about in verse 1, hath quickened us together, made us alive, with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Like I said, these heavenly places, I taught in the past that it was some special third heaven position for the body of Christ, almost like you know that exclusive room, the country club, but it's not limited to that. This encompasses all creation in the new heaven, the new earth, and new Jerusalem. Sadly, those that I know that have this limited militant grace view of rightly dividing kind of miss out on this gratitude. They're grateful that they're in an exclusive place in the third heaven. They think they're going to remain there and not have any contact with the rest of God's creation. That, to me, when I think about it, is is such a... It robs us of the blessing of these things that we're talking about, to be grateful to know we're going to talk to and encounter and speak to angels. We're going to speak to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We can talk to Paul. We can talk to all number of individuals, and we're going to have access to the new earth. We're going to have access to all of the new creation, the new heavens. So I'm grateful for that. And uh, I think we should always be grateful for that. It, we, we, Well, we're going to read a passage that kind of encapsulates my thought that we have no idea what we're going to discover and explore when we get there. And uh, the passage doesn't say it that way, but I'll remind you of it when we get there. Staying in Ephesians 2, let's look in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Did you know you were created unto good works? They well, what that work? That, that word is a four-letter word for some people. That, it's a bad word. <laughs> but do you know why you were created unto good works? So we can earn rewards to the praise of God's glory through the work that he does through us. You know, when you think about it, the inheritance, just being there would have been enough. But we get to reign with Christ if we suffer for him. That's why the apostles, including Paul and Silas, sang praises unto God and rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame. They weren't rejoicing at the beatings they just received. They were rejoicing that because they suffered, rewards would be theirs. And it would bring praise and glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, but it would be theirs eternally. That's an amazing thought that not only do we get to be a part of the inheritance, and I'd have been happy to just be a a, a dog in the backyard, if, if you want to put it like that. But we have the opportunity to serve the Lord so that we might reign with him and receive a crown. That's amazing to me and worthy of our gratitude. And if we're not serving the Lord, we have to ask ourselves, why? Do we not understand what's at stake for us? The reward that we can have, pressing toward the mark of the prize? Over and over, Paul tells us to, to reach forward to that, to press towards the crown. What are we not getting about that that causes us to be complacent? Maybe it's a lack of understanding of the reward so that the gratitude's being hindered and blocked. Look in verse 19, chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, we as Gentiles once were, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Citizens, can you imagine? And we are citizens of a kingdom, the kingdom of God. That will never end. And members of God's household. 
Can you imagine? Remember when you were young, Dad, can I borrow the car? I have uh, to go meet my friend somewhere. Can you imagine? And the new heaven and the new earth, we're asking God the Father, can we borrow the chariot? I need to go to Pluto. Or who knows what we'll be exploring and discovering there. And I think that brings me back to the passage that I told you about, which I'm going to have you turn there now, 1 Corinthians 2. It doesn't say anything about barring the chariot to go to Pluto. <laughs> but we, keep, we do read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, page 1658. And Paul writes, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We can't even imagine it. I could go on and on listing the things God has prepared for us that we do know. And just two chapters in Ephesians was enough to see how grateful we should be. But it wouldn't even scratch the surface according to this passage. We have no idea. God's revealed them unto us by a spirit so we can see a glimpse. We can see some of them. That's what we've done. We've covered a few. But I think God probably has saved a few surprises for us. What do you think? Maybe he's going to allow us to spend eternity discovering the depth of his wisdom, his grace, his mercy, his love, his creation. I'm excited about that. And for that, we can be grateful. So coming back around to where we started in Philippians chapter 4, we started off seeing how gratitude or thanksgiving is the key to allowing the peace of God to rule in our hearts. Go back there, Philippians 4. And we read it just to remind you, verse 6, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer. And by the way, this is page 1713. Sorry for not giving you that in advance. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. God's not promising that everything you ask for, he'll give you. We're to pray about it. Pray about all things. But the promise is in verse 7. Then the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you want to get rid of the doubt, the worry, the anxiety, the fear? Start being thankful. Pray about it. Lift it up to the Lord. And how do we maintain a grateful heart once we get it? It's through what we think about. Look at the next verse, verse 8. And it, notice how Paul closes with this. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Verse 8 could be a meditation in itself. If you think about these things, I would imagine that's going to lower your heart rate. It's going to bring you some peace, some calm in a troubled world. And then he said, verse 9, those things which you've both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Well, we don't have time to look at all the things that Paul did and see that we've seen and heard from him, but we looked at one thing that he and Silas did in prison. They sang praises unto God after being suffered, after suffering a beating, and then they prayed. So prayer, thanksgiving, rejoicing, maybe singing, whatever it takes to get you through the times when we're doubtful or concerned or afraid or worried. Gratitude is the key, being thankful for what we do have. And if God was able to make all things work together for good in the past, why do we doubt he can't do that again in the future? Especially Right now, when we see the world going to hell in a handbasket and we see nothing but lies and deception coming from our so-called leaders and 
you know what? That's not the way God sees it at all. So in closing, I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 21. This is definitely a passage that uh, Jeremiah 20, 29, if I said, I think I said 21, 29. Uh, this is definitely a passage that has a context to Israel. Um, and it's about the restoration of Israel. So it's a future application for them. But there's a spiritual application that we can apply right now. It's page 1127, Jeremiah 29. And I want to start reading in verse 11, where God says to Israel, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Do you know that God has an expected end for you? And we've looked at a few things already in that inheritance. Then, verse 12, shall you call upon me? And you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I want to close with the thought that if God's thoughts toward us are only of peace and not of evil, then that should give us a peace. And for that, we can be thankful. We are reconciled to him by his son, Jesus. If we are to be eternally grateful for his grace in the heavenly places, then we can be grateful daily for it right now too. And my hope and prayer for you is that you can find that for which you are thankful so that you can let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That thanksgiving is the key to knowing peace. So really, maybe the message shouldn't have been titled gratitude. It should have been titled peace. Because ultimately, what I want you to know is the peace of God that passes all understanding. And the key is gratitude. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to ask him right now to save you by trusting him. Believe that God sent him to die for you. Had you been the only person in the world, he would have sent his son to pay for your sins that you might live eternally with him. And I pray that you would trust him right now, calling on the Lord to be saved so that you too might be eternally grateful for what God did for you. Thank you for listening today and I hope you will rejoice in your salvation. Thank you for listening today. If you are enjoying these messages and would like to support us, you can make a tax-deductible donation through our Unlock the Bible Now app, which is free to download from your device's app store, or go to utbnow.com. We appreciate you for giving whatever the Lord lays upon your heart.